Hello and welcome. The last few months have been dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The AKDN response covers prevention, urgent humanitarian assistance, and preparing the healthcare system to care for those infected. Each region comes with its own set of challenges and institutions have to adapt accordingly. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you a distinguished panel we have here today to really get into the conversation and the issues at stake. I'd like to introduce first Hadi Husseini, the Central Asia CEO of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, Dr. Najmuddin Najm, the Afghanistan CEO for the Aga Khan Foundation, Dr. Maher Abu Mayala, Syria CEO for the Aga Khan Health Services, Dr. Asim Belgaumi, the Chief Medical Officer for the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, and Dr. Zinat Suleiman Khan, who is with the Aga Khan Health Services and is the Global Head of Nursing and the Quality Coordinator. Welcome. I'd like to start with Hadi. Hadi, could you give us a sense of the situation in Central Asia? Yeah, absolutely, Zane. Thank you. <clears throat> it's, it's great to be here and greetings from, uh, from Dushanbe here in Tajikistan. In Central Asia, in, in our context here, we, we've been looking at the, the impact of COVID really from two perspectives. We, we have the immediate health impact, we have the medical impact, we have the, the impact on population from, uh, from people who, 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 have, who have actually gotten sick. Uh, but we also have the, the other issues around uh, the fact that in responding to uh, COVID, countries have taken uh, a very, very severe measures in the region to lock down and close borders and to, to limit the impact of, of travel, uh, which has had a real, real economic impact. So, so both from a, uh, from a health response impact and from an economic impact, we've had real, real, we've had real challenges. Primarily in the areas of, of Tajikistan and Afghanistan. Uh, Tajikistan, uh, because of um, the, 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 the impact on remittances, because of the fact that uh, people aren't able to travel abroad and, and bring back uh, resources, we, we've had real shortfalls in terms of being able to um, continue to have the kind of quality of life that we've had before. Uh, and, and both in Afghanistan and Tajikistan, because of the uh, limits around healthcare and the health system, uh, we've had real challenges around uh, being able to meet the needs of the real spike in cases that we've had both in both geographies. Dr. Najam, what about Afghanistan? Give us a little bit more information about what your experience has been like there. Well, I think uh, um, uh, Hadi started uh, with uh, an important point that uh, uh, we see this uh, a multi-dimensional uh, issue. It's not only a health issue, but also it uh, uh, affects many sectors of life. Uh, and I think that's something that we are experiencing in Central Asia overall. Uh, the medium-term uh, impacts of COVID-19, uh, which also includes matters uh, like uh, food security, uh, matters uh, like uh, connecting communities to resources and making sure that those immediate shocks are prevented. And finally, the longer-term development needs of communities. We all know that this pandemic may change a lot of things in the life of communities that we work and we live with. So uh, we are looking at those uh, long-term impacts that COVID-19 may have on communities' life. Uh, Maher Abdul Mayale, what about in Syria? Uh, in fact, uh, let me say that in Syria, we, we didn't leave the crisis of the war. And the uh, COVID-19 pandemic came in, in a critical situation for the uh, Syrian people. Uh, but uh, we tried to make it as uh, like um, uh, also opportunity, look at, uh, so we, we tried with the Jama'at institution, the EKDN agency, to build in on our experience to face the humanitarian crisis in Syria. So we came together uh, beginning of March to try to develop our uh, response plan. And uh, our response, in fact, came uh, earlier than uh, uh, the government uh, procedures. So we, uh, in fact, uh, we, in the way, we pushed the government to, to start also the response in, in the country at the same time. Dr. Balgami, what about in Pakistan? 
I don't think our situation is very much different than others, except probably because of the population, it's further compounded. Um, what was said earlier uh, by Dr. Najmuddin as well um, is that it was twofold. There's this, there's the health um, aspect of it, but also equally importantly is the economic aspect. Um, while we've been working on uh, trying to curb the infections through lockdowns, etc., uh, one of the things that we've seen and the government has been struggling with um, a lot really is um, is the economic impact. Many, many people in Pakistan are day, day wages um, and they work on a daily basis. And when we had the lockdown in April, that created a lot of uh, economic issues for people. Where are they going to get the next food from, the next meal? Uh, and so those were the issues that really had to be balanced with um, lockdown for the infection. And I think that's really been a concern. And since the lockdown has been eased, we're actually starting to see this incredible surge over the last two or three weeks. Um, and the government continues to, to tussle between uh, lockdown versus not lockdown. So that's been a really, really um, difficult issue. And it's a difficult issue globally as everybody tries to hit that balance between health and economics and, and how to handle lockdowns. Uh, Dr. Zinat Suleiman, as, as a key nursing expert here, uh, what has been your perspective of how the situation has been handled and the kind of role that you've been playing uh, for the institutions uh, in, in advising on, uh, on, on behaviours and the general approach from your point of view? As we know that Corona is a normal virus, meaning a new virus uh, that has not been previously identified. Thus, very early in, in the pandemic, uh, uh, people like myself and many other specialists uh, in infectious disease, in public health, we got together to understand how can we work with our institutions, whether they are hospitals or primary health centers. So it has been a, a, a really enlightening and, and, and a scary journey to deal with this COVID pandemic. I think we've hit a lot of uh, really important topics in this conversation, and one main theme is you can't separate the health from the economics. Uh, if if I if I could just spend a little bit of time delving more deeply into each aspect, I think that could prove value given where each of you are sitting on the front lines uh, in this crisis. Hadi, if we could drill down on the health piece a little bit here, um, what, what from your perspective is the situation, for example, with PPEs for health workers, uh, medical supplies, um, even testing? Tajikistan has, uh, has had a, a, a really uh, unique kind of a, a challenge in, in, in responding and, and in being able to get in front of the health crisis, primarily because the testing capacity has been very, very, very low and very weak in the country. And as a result, we've not really been able to mobilize as quickly to protect, uh, in the early days, uh, the, the, the health workers across the country as, as uh, other countries had been able to. And, and so from a, uh, from a, from a response perspective, from, from looking at the way that, um, that, that we deal with the health emergency, uh, some of the priorities that we've had in our response, our AKDN response, our, 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 our pan-institutional response, um, have been around protecting our health workers. And, and, uh, and, and in our context, our health workers are health workers from the AKDN system, but, but even more so the hundreds of health workers that are part of the government and private healthcare facilities that are across uh, the country um, and then our, our frontline workers. So working with uh, the European Union, working with the, the USAID, big donors, as well as the, the global task force, mobilizing literally within, within weeks, uh, if not days sometimes, uh, thousands of uh, PPE uh, sets to be able to get to those frontline workers, being able to support emergency response technicians, being able to uh, move mountains uh, literally, which is, uh, which, is, which is not an ironic phrase in our context, uh, but, um, but, but to get things, uh, get things on the ground quickly. And, and that, uh, that, that, in, that in itself has been uh, kind of one of the key, uh, key abilities uh, for us to have been able to weather it as well as we have. Uh, but but it, um, it's been heartbreaking to see uh, for, for those places that haven't been able to get PPE very quickly across uh, Afghanistan and Tajikistan, uh, what, what that impact has been. And it's, it's been devastating. It's been devastating on families, on, on communities. Uh, um, the, the, the actual fear that's reverberated through the countries and, and not knowing what happens next 
Um, it's, it's had a real impact. So it's been, it's been wonderful uh, to see how quickly we, we could come together, but, but also quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite, quite disturbing to see the impact if we had not been able to. One of the key uh, considerations here is the, the messaging that needs to be done successfully within countries and to communities um, on prevention. Uh, Dr. Najam, what has that been like in Afghanistan? Has there been uh, cultural conflicts or myths that you have to grapple with? How have you handled that in Afghanistan? Well, I think that is uh, one of the uh, uh, very challenging aspects of the work with COVID-19, uh, because you are dealing with uh, changing habits in uh, societies uh, uh, that uh, those uh, uh, maybe norms and uh, those kind of uh, social uh, level norms uh, existing for maybe uh, hundreds of years. And now, because of this uh, fast uh, changing trend of uh, the pandemic, you would like to uh, change also those uh, those habits in the communities. Uh, I think this is the, the most difficult part of the effort, uh, but I think uh, uh, a lot of effort has been made. Uh, we have tried to reach with our capacities in Afghanistan to every single community that we work. We uh, try to penetrate in every single community to make sure that uh, they are sensitized. We create awareness and uh, we try to make sure that they understand the ser seriousness of this situation. Uh, we also know that community's role uh, uh, is beyond the understanding. Uh, I think in a situation uh, that uh, governments are failing to uh, deliver and we have a health system that may not be able to reach to every single corner of societies uh, uh, and in, in a such a, a difficult time for the whole world, communities play an important role at their own area to uh, not only inform each other about the seriousness of the issue, to not only take the measures at their household and uh, family level, but also to support the system, to make sure that there is uh, a social level referral system in place, to make sure that they understand limitations that uh, our health uh, service delivery points they have. They are also equ equipped with tools that they uh, understand the early warning systems when it comes to the economic and other uh, uh, development impacts of the COVID-19. Dr. Zinat Suleiman, I, I, I see you nodding vigorously uh, here. I wonder if you can, uh, if, if, if you can give us, uh, you know, an idea on what, what are the kind of some of the things that you've been advising uh, the COVID-19 task force when it comes to communication and prevention? How, how do you see it and how do you deal with uh, issues such as uh, you have to social distance? Um, but yet, you know, culturally, it's challenging. Uh, economically, it's, it adds another factor um, in, in some high density areas. So how can people do that, for example, in communities where they don't, they're don't, they not online, for example? Yeah. Let me give you an example of northern Pakistan, uh, where uh, Gilgit, Hunza, Chitral, where really not everyone is connected. And I, I must compliment the National Task Force of Pakistan, the uh, Health Board and Aga Khan Health Services, who went to the the most remote areas of Gilgit, Hunza, Chitral, and they had very innovative ideas. They went with those microphones on those piki piki and tuk tuks, and they were talking to uh, the, the people who were literally on the mountains, talking to them about and giving these messages. Uh, and 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 they also had radio was one of the most is one of the most common uh, media of communication there. Now we are saying. What are the strategies you want to adapt to live with COVID rather than running away from COVID? Maya Abdu Mayala, that's a really important point. Um, how, how are you applying this in, in Syria? How, what kind of innovative or new strategies are you using uh, given uh, the environment that Syria is currently operating in, which, is, which, is, which has been a war-torn environment for many years, adding another layer to your challenges? Uh, in fact, let me start to about the challenge with the public messaging and the raise awareness of the public, which usually, maybe not just in Syria, in many countries, that the messaging coming from one direction. The communication usually coming from Ministry of Health or government to the people. Do this, don't do this, so the people feel 
uh, sometimes boring from the, these messages because they don't understand what behind exactly about these messages. And sometimes they feel this not uh, appropriate for their context. So what we try to do is uh, to, to have as much we can uh, community engagement in our awareness campaign. So we try to produce too many educational materials, poster, uh, poster brochures, uh, and mobilize hundreds of uh, volunteers from the community, from the councils, local councils. Uh, we have trained virtually, even by WhatsApp groups, more than 700 volunteers who have a network uh, through uh, social media, as well as to do also some home visits, as well as we mobilized uh, uh, mobile medical teams to reach to the areas where maybe the access to internet will be uh, limited. And uh, we covered uh, more than 60,000 uh, from the population of uh, Salamia district. Uh, uh, we, we tried to use many channels to, uh, to address the issue which uh, Najm uh, mentioned, the behavior change. You couldn't just uh, depend that you sent the message and finished. So you need to have like interaction with the people. To, uh, so we try to use even the videos. Uh, we try to use uh, our, our own Facebook page to have some uh, also interaction with the uh, people. So we, we estimated that we reached to more than uh, 1,200, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 100,020 population out of the uh, 250,000 in Salamia. Uh, to Pakistan and, and to uh, Dr. Balgami, AKU is a significant player um, in the country. What have been the successes and failures when it comes to communication and, and messaging in, in the country from your point of view? I think communication, as as Maher just said, that we that, that what is communicated is critically important. And I'll give you an example. Um, after a four week complete lockdown, when the government decided to ease the lockdown a little bit, one of the one of the uh, the comments I got from the parent of a patient of mine is that, oh well, the government's opened up, so I guess COVID is gone. Uh, and that to me was, I mean, I sort of, you know, held my heart and I said, no, it hasn't gone, you know. Um, and I think <laughs> and I think that is the kind of message that needs to go out, um, that uh, this th th that these changes in the lockdown, these changes in prevention that has that have been done, have really been done to allow people that little bit of movement. And that's not much must be taken in context of the whole picture. Um, so those have been the issues. I think people are slowly starting to get more and more used to living with COVID. Um, uh, and, and I think that is coming through. I'm seeing many, many more people uh, coming out with, with, you know, wearing masks and being physically distant from each other. Um, the government has had to really be strong in terms of um, application of the SOPs for uh, you know, how to open shops, how to open uh, factories, etc. And that's really been a problem here. Um, in the big cities of Pakistan, really, in both Karachi and Lahore have been really badly affected because of the populations. So what would you advise uh, that uh, what people do as they start to leave their homes and, and, and open up uh, as the lockdowns ease? So here in the United States, for example, I mean, that's the new balance that everyone's trying to figure out. You know, um, how do I do I go to a restaurant? Do I visit my friends? Uh, do I, I definitely wear a mask, but am I OK not wearing a mask outside? Uh, do I still keep having to wash my hands as many times? Should I really keep six feet apart or... Uh, uh, you know, could I could could I get away with being in an environment with friends that I know? So, what is the guidance as lockdowns ease, even in high density areas that you've mentioned, um, uh, Dr. Balgami, that AKU is advising? So, I, at this point in time, I think we need to continue with uh, physical distancing. I don't think we're at the stage um, that several of the other countries who had the COVID pandemic earlier. 
Um, so we're we're really on the upsurge, and I think um, it's still not time for um, us to relax things. So I think we've really got to continue uh, to be extra careful about it. Masks, um, hand hygiene, distancing, avoid going to places where you'll get um, you, where, where you'd unnecessarily get in um, in touch with people. Um, you know, buy in bulk. <laughs> Things like when you can, and so things like that, which I think are critically important. Uh, Dr. Zinat Suleiman, you said something um, quite interesting, and I think really important. Uh, you you re re refer to mental health. Uh, what has been the mental health impact on the communities as they've been going through COVID, as they've been isolated, and h how is it that 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 from your vantage point, uh, you're you're seeing it from from the COVID nineteen task force, and 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 asking and telling them what they need to do. Uh, that was one of the first things, uh, first of the uh, sort of mental health uh, issues which, which came up, that how do, we keep, how do we keep our seniors engaged and, and keep them in the loop? Firstly, we are keeping them as high risk uh, population and keeping them away from everyone. And, and, and then that they do not have any other places to go to. Uh, so high, uh, mental health for our high risk population in terms of senior citizens have been on top of our agenda. The second group which we always talk about are, are also the young people and the bread earners. Uh, the bread earners who have grown so worried about, go, they want to go out because they need to put food on the table for their families. So that responsibility and that not able to do that uh, has also been a major mental distress for young people. So that's another aspect which we have been talking to the younger generation, young people about how do they manage their mental health and, and again all the precautions taken how do they have to go out and work uh, to earn their uh, uh, bread uh, so that's the second group of team people we have been talking to of course kids and young people playing out not going out and staying in four walls they have been really upset about it but then they take it out on their parents and, and mothers who have to deal with husbands being at home and the kids being at home that's a lot of pressure on, on their heads. So we have sort of handled mental health by, by, by population and really worked with them and, and giving them guidelines on how, do, how can they de-stress themselves and, and get involved in constructive activities uh, and, and reduce this mental uh, pressure. And what are the guidelines? So if, for example, when we, let's take the vulnerable patient, vulnerable population, our high risk uh, uh, population. So we are talking to our, our senior citizens, our parents, and, and firstly giving them the reasons why we are requesting them to stay away because they are high risk, they are important for us, and we do not want them to get infected. So it's for their good health and it is for their benefit. Have you noticed uh, a, a, an impact from a gender standpoint on women and girls specifically? Um, you know, globally, this has become a major topic, and obviously, in in our regions here, uh, I'm sure that there's been a p potential uptick in in all sorts of impact uh, from uh, violence potentially to mental health issues to just the general stress level uh, that uh, women and girls have to go through. Being out of school for girls as well. Um, in some areas and the long-term impact that that has. So I wonder if we could just talk about the gender impact um, and then uh, I'll spend a bit more time on the economics of it. Well, uh, I think it is um, it has its own impact, uh, especially in a society that is taking some uh, important steps towards uh, uh, improving the rule of women, both in social and economic dimensions of life when we are taking some important steps for girls' education uh, in Afghanistan, and AKDN is an important uh, part of that efforts in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that is also uh, not only creating education facility, uh, but also provides an environment for women and girls to come and then to get together, to be more active in the society. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an impact. Uh, and uh, in addition to whatever you uh, uh, already mentioned and Hadi mentioned, I think this is uh, uh, another effect that we see. But we have also come up uh, actively, we are working very closely with Ministry of uh, Education to make sure that uh, we use any possible alternative 
to reach to uh, people houses and to Jamaat houses. Uh, for the first time, AKDN supported Ministry of Education in Afghanistan to uh, uh, to uh, telecast the uh, uh, to the school lessons to every single household in Afghanistan for the next uh, three to six months, and I think that is one of the major uh, contribution to the current uh, education system. And in addition to that, I think engaging women in in the response, as Hadi also mentioned, uh, beyond health workers. Uh, if you uh, engage women groups, uh, the vocational groups to be engaged in producing local materials uh, for COVID-19 response. If you activate your community-based saving groups uh, uh, in, in case of Afghanistan, uh, uh, in about uh, uh, three to 4,000 uh, community-based saving groups that we support, uh, more than 70% of these groups are women groups. So if they are uh, uh, again, activated uh, so that they uh, use the access to credit that they have, access to uh, the uh, uh, money that they have at the, at the village level is used for health purposes and uh, to cope uh, as a coping mechanism at the community level. I think these are, uh, these are important steps that are taken and we'll continue to, uh, continue to uh, uh, follow it uh, in coming weeks and months. Uh, Dr. Bolgami, uh, wh what about the role of technology uh, and uh, the role that uh, AKU is playing uh, in, in that uh, in Pakistan? Um, as far as technology is concerned, I think what we've really done at AKU in, a AKU in Pakistan is that really start, started looking at um, uh, using technology as a means for social distancing, uh, providing, uh, so we've gone on and we've uh, rapidly instituted teleclinics um, so that patients who need to come into the hospital for other things, not COVID, but others, diabetes, heart, cancer, etc., can actually uh, communicate with their, with their doctors and the healthcare providers from home and don't have to come in to the hospital. Um, we've also gone ahead and started working on um, a tele-ICU concept. Um, so not only are we using intensive care specialists who are at AKUH in Karachi, but we've actually reached out to um, alumni who are all over the world, in UK, in the US mainly. Um, and they've all volunteered their time to, um, to, to, to actually conduct consultations um, for patients who are in the ICU. And this is not only for uh, our hospital, but actually we've contracted with the government of Sindh to provide tele-ICU consultation across many, many of the hospitals in the province of Sindh. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's been really, really useful. Um, the other thing that we've started doing is doing a lot of webinars and using the, 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 uh, the teleconferencing um, to teach people. And we've, we've gone out and we've had uh, multiple uh, webinars and, and, and workshops where we've been able to train um, healthcare workers on how to wear PPEs, um, um, nurses for ICUs, um, doctors with, who, 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 on, on how, to, how to treat patients with COVID. Um, and really with that, we've been able to reach out to hundreds and thousands of people who physically we would not have been able to. Zina. Coming to the uh, technology, and uh, Dr. Asim uh, talked a lot about what university has been doing, and a lot of Aga Khan Health Services institutions are, are, are doing exactly what he talked about. I want to add one more aspect, and that is the cure, care aspect. We know COVID is lethal. It is really hitting, once the patients become critical, and, and, and severe patients who need ventilators, they need ventilators. Whether a patient is in the northern Pakistan in, or, or Syria or Tajikistan or in a university tertiary hospital. So how do we ensure that we provide technology to these patients? And just to give you uh, an example of, of northern Pakistan, uh, we had in March, we had about 27 beds only 
to take care of patients uh, uh, but uh, by within uh, april and may we expanded uh, these this capacity from 27 to 110 beds by erecting field hospitals and and a lot of other agencies like aka uh, the aga khan uh, agency for habitat uh, etc helped us in the hospitals to do that and Aga Khan University helped us to train our nurses and doctors in the middle of those mountains to take care of patients who will get on ventilators. So the ventilators are not just for cities because patients will get critical in the middle of, of, of those mountains and jungles. So I think this, this disease has really opened up our perspective about caring for patients from primary health prevention all the way to tertiary care and and uh, and critical patients may i add for the technology uh, uh, one uh, important point in in uh, salamia we have a district public district hospital and the capacity for the health professional to deal with the critical cases it's limited while we have in the provincial uh, hospital in hama much advanced equipment as well as professional health professionals so what we are doing now we are helping to connect the intensive care unit in salamia hospital to the provincial hospital so they can even the residents they can get the consultation directly from from the uh, center of the province from hama which also one of the way how to use the technology to support the district uh, in, in the medical uh, consultation. Hadi Husseini, if, if I could ask uh, you to weigh in in, in the little time we uh, have left um, and, and deal with the food security question that everybody raised mm -hmm. right at the start of this conversation. Uh, there's a health crisis, uh, but in parallel, an, an economic crisis uh, and, and a food crisis. So how, how, how are you dealing with that for Central Asia? With the support of the institutions, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a very quick uh, targeted intervention, we were able to provide access and, and, and supply of flour into the market to be able to stabilize it, which not only kept um, uh, the prices within range of, of the Jamaat, but, but uh, was, was able to, uh, in fact, uh, prop up the private sector, which was, which was flagging. So it's a big issue. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to stabilize markets. Uh, we, we are, you know, a lot of the a lot of the fact uh, a lot of the economic issues are in Tajikistan and primarily are around remittances not coming back in, uh, and as a result, uh, you know, of, of closed borders, uh, seeds are more expensive, fertilizer is more expensive, access to water and land, which was already tough uh, because of climate change, is now even even more uh, more problematic. So being able to um, to being being able to support folks who are, are abroad to provide more remittances back, uh, to be able to um, uh, enable those people who can't travel abroad to be engaged with other parts of the economy so that there is, there is money. These are all things that we're working on very, very quickly. But I'll be frank with you, going into next winter, we're, we're still quite concerned. I think both for Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and I'm sure across most of uh, Northern Pakistan, preparing for the lean season up ahead is going to be a, a very big issue for us. Yeah. Dr. Najam, uh, is that is that your is that your main concern as well? And how is Afghanistan putting cash and food in, in people's homes and pockets? Uh, in addition to what uh, Hadi said, and the similar activities were also carried out by uh, colleagues at ACA and other agencies in Afghanistan. We also try to make sure that we give priority to agriculture activities this year. Uh, despite COVID-19 restrictions and lockdown, we try to make sure that we deal with agriculture input supplies to the farmers as the most critical activity that we had to conduct for the season. We wanted to make sure that they have access to inputs so that we boost uh, the local production and make sure that, uh, uh, as colleagues said, we prepare them for the next winter, which will be difficult. Uh, I think uh, we had some good rain and snowfall this year in Afghanistan. I think that helps for the current harvest. But that chronic uh, food security issues that we have in high altitude areas, I think that will be there and there, uh, there will be a pressure on communities. We need to uh, also remind ourselves that food security is one part of the whole pressure on the livelihoods. People will lose income. 
people will lose migration, the borders will be closed, access to food in the market will be limited in the coming months. I think these are the implications that we all as, uh, as an institution, we are dealing with in coming months and the uh, uh, winter, as colleagues said, will be uh, more difficult. Maher, in, uh, in Syria, what, what, is, uh, what are your thoughts on the economics and food security? Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard uh, days in Syria. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the results of the war, and now with COVID-19, we, we are passing very, very difficult uh, economic crisis uh, right now. Uh, EKF particularly working very closely with the WFP, uh, to keep providing food basket as well as sometimes cash to the people. They developed very, very good uh, uh, selection criteria for the vulnerable people because if we will consider all the poor people, uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't handle this. So we are trying to target the ultra poor uh, people in, in coordination as well as with the National Council. They have also their criteria. They are also trying to help with uh, social welfare in many aspects. But uh, in fact, they need too much. They need too much. I'd like to ask uh, everyone uh, one final question, and uh, if I could just go around uh, the virtual room uh, and get everyone's perspective uh, here. I'll start with uh, Dr. Asim Belgami. Uh, what is it that you believe is the most important thing that anybody watching needs to understand right now about COVID-19? And what is the most important lesson that you've learned in the last few months that you know now that you didn't know then? So two questions, actually. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, so I, I think the first thing that we've got to understand is um, it's not going to go away very, very soon. I think it's here to stay. Uh, we're seeing this in other countries as well, where they're getting second waves and third waves coming through. Um, so really, it, it needs to be a change in the way we function. Um, and so that's that's one thing that we've got to hold on to. And as we plan um, um, for for reopening our lives, essentially, um, we've got to keep that in mind. Uh, and what we've learned is we've really got to be agile. Um, I think uh, what we what 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 we've seen is um, that the information that that leads to our decisions. Um, has changed constantly over the last few months. You know, this is what the virus does, therefore we do this. And then it changes and say, oh no, not this. This is what needs to be done. Um, and, and so uh, it, that agility needs to be there and the nimbleness that needs to be there in terms of decision making and that, um, that ability to change, to switch what you've done and, and go to something different. And I think those two things have been really, really important. Thank you. Uh, Maher, uh, your uh, takeaway for our audience and uh, greatest lesson learned. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my, my, uh, what I want to share is uh, my opinion about the health system uh, strengthening and uh, the criteria how to identify this health system fragile or strong. Uh, I think the definition of this completely changed because it's not related right now to the number of hospital or beds or the technology they have it or how much do you have uh, advanced health professional. It's more about equity. It's more about the right to health. It's more about reaching everyone. Uh, it's uh, for that reason, the investment in primary health care is crucial every way. We know now in COVID-19, if you invest only in to treat the critical cases, you will have a, a, like a very minimum impact. Uh, the main investment should be in prevention. Uh, so it needs comprehensive integrated approach about the, the health. Uh, it should uh, it need uh, to look about the health as investment as a human right issue. Thank you very much. Uh, you have all been fantastic. 
and uh, very informative. And I just want to thank you and say for myself that I greatly admire and respect uh, the, the brilliant work that you're doing uh, on behalf of the community and, and the countries uh, that you're working in and showing real leadership. Uh, and in, in a time that is so challenging and so scary for all of us, we feel that we have a steady hand at the wheel here. So thank you very much. Uh, it's also, by the way, very exciting to have uh, Syria, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Tanzania, Pakistan uh, on a program like this. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank finally, you. Uh, many of you have been asking how to support AKDN's important work during this pandemic. So I really want you to go to the AKDN website, please, and learn more about the Global Pandemic Fund. Thank you so much for watching and see you soon.